Uh, Mark, uh, phenomenal job. Uh, I I was just goofing with you a bit about how you weren't you know did, weren't sure about this one, didn't think it was going to be all that great, and yet I swear you're just like that AP honors kid that's always like this test is going to whoop me, and then you get like 103. <laughs> so uh, so a, a, a couple of things that that's that encouraged me um, tremendously was. Um, was and, and I think David and I think we've all already kind of just mentioned it is is God buries the worker and the work goes on. I, I think just that we, we need to hunt down who owns that. Um, but but ultimately, what a what a beautiful truth in, in regards to keeping you in check um, for really gospel ministry. That that regardless of what successes you see, and so you, you you're talking about humility and you're talking about lowliness and, and love the. Lloyd Jones, I don't like that. Um, but, but, but ultimately, if if you understand that you bury, God buries the worker, but the work goes on. If if you, I, I said to Platt, I mean, yeah, Moses dies, and then it just keeps going. David dies, and it just keeps going. It, it's well, not. And you were, I think it's from Charles Bridges, the Christian Ministry. I think that's where I remember getting that from. But you got a real, real reminder of that personally three years ago. How did that affect your own ministry? Um. Well, I think I'd, I tweeted out because people would say to me that there was like this kind of false confidence that I was going to make it because I was Matt Chandler. And so I remember tweeting out once, why not me? Why, like, why, like, God's whole kingdom here? And, you know, it's like, oh, it really hinges on this Chandler kid. I mean, how weak and sad is God if, if I'm the big solution to his problem, right? And, and so, I, man, I, I think it, it, it's definitely sobering. And, and definitely made very clear to me what's true about all of us. Uh, I mean, I, I've said since my diagnosis that, that really what I get to walk in is what's true for all of us. I, I just, it's just a little closer for me. Um, and so, I mean, there, there's people in this room die going home tonight. Right? Now, nobody in this room thinks that's them. No, nobody thinks that could possibly happen to them, but it could. And, and so to, to have that ever before me creates a... You know, I've, I've said before that, you know, that here's this prayer of Moses, teach me to number my days. You know, he's fighting to remember this, and, and I even have to ask for it. You know, the Lord just kind of gift wrapped that mug for me and, and just said, hey, your days are numbered, and I'm going to, every couple of months, give you a little reminder of that. And, and so I think that helps with all of this, like the pictures and the Christian Hollywood or whatever. It, it's just, it, it's easier to go, okay, I understand. I, I understand. I have heroes, but it, at the same time, I, listen, I'm they're all perishing, brother. I think one of the big advantages of looking at the sort of larger picture of Scripture from Genesis through Ezekiel, you know, in through the Gospels and into Acts is you see, it's like we're deliberately trying to make sure God's plan doesn't succeed. We are so disobedient. We are so sinful. We are so squander what He gives us. And yet, like this master chess player, you know, who just knows to, how to completely, you know, move around the other side. He is just getting done exactly what he means to get done and continues on. And, and I've never seen, and we'll have to get other people involved. This is why it's bad. Just you, you and I will sit here and chat. But the, um, the, the Joppa connection, I mean, just never, did, were, did you, anybody else that, like, that, that on, that's you preached where, it before, surely. I, I preached it, and I look back at my notes to make sure that, yeah, I'd gotten it. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> Nailed it. I was encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. But it is powerful. I mean, yes, there's no accident in, no, in, any, in anything. So on, uh, I've had various conversations with pastors who, based upon stories of dreams and visions overseas, say, well, you know, we've just not been obedient, so God's getting it done another way. So um, what do you say to pastors in those circumstances? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I've heard those stories from Muslim countries, especially Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, of, of people having visions and then going uh, and getting saved. But it has always, without fail, and the stories that have been recounted to me, I'm thinking of like Christy Wilson, people like that, has involved the vision telling them to go to find a certain person. So Christy Wilson tells this story of it, this happening to him, you know, a, an Afghan person coming up to him, to his house, and saying, I had a dream where Isha, you know, Jesus appeared to me and told me to find Christy Wilson, gave, gave him the name. This person was from the country, not even from the city. He was in Kabul, 
goes to, into Kabul, finds Christy Wilson through some help, and Christy leads this person to the Lord. So that's, those are the stories that I hear. I've not heard the kind where God sort of short-circuits the evangelists and just dumps the gospel through an angelic messenger. I don't see why he couldn't do that, but it's clear here he doesn't want that done. It's clear in Romans 10 that he means it to be us evangelizing and having the privilege of bearing that message. You know, I was uh, uh, speaking with... I don't know if I should say the people group. Well, well, we use a name, a code name for this people group, so the Arundo, but uh, very few Christians among this people group. And I was talking with a woman recently um, overseas who uh, is among this people group. I mean, if, if anybody found out she was a Christian, she'd have her throat slit immediately. And she shared that she was in, she had decided to kill herself. She was just at the end of her rope, and uh, she goes into a dark room. She's got all this medicine that she's about to take, and she sees this light, and she has this vision of Jesus, and long story short, from there, she decides not to kill herself. She finds a Catholic church, because that's the only place where she's seen Jesus, and so she goes. So I'm thinking, oh, no, this is, but even the Lord, how he used this Catholic church, false gospel, to uh, eventually steer her to somebody else she met through that. She's come to faith in Christ, and now she's working for the spread of the gospel among the Aruno through the human messenger. It's just God... It's like he's got this thing rigged, so. Yeah. Yes. Well, anything else stand out at the meeting? Mark or, or Tony's. We haven't got a chance to talk about Tony's yet either. I was just encouraged with, with, with both talks. I've just been fed by the word all day and, and just so thankful uh, for the Lord blessing, um, blessing his word. Um, Challenge at various points, just in, in very sort of succinct ways in that, that the Lord uses just to challenge us to be faithful in evangelism. Um, so just thinking about um, I am where I am for a reason, take the opportunities. Um, how do you know that God is preparing people to hear the good news? Well, it's the people that he's brought near to you. Um, just particularly effective uh, in that way and just grateful for you for your labors. Uh, in the Lord, brother, and uh, in, in courage. Greatly encouraged. Yeah, I love the way you read the scriptures. Uh, it's just fantastic. Um, just a practical pastoral question. You mentioned music just in passing. Uh, I would love to hear everyone's involvement here with selection. You talked about the importance of getting the gospel right in music. Do you select the songs? Do you confirm? What do you do? And then I'd love to hear what everybody else does. I select all the hymns. Uh, we have a worship guide who has us singing wonderful things week to week. We meet once a week to review last week's service, plan the coming week's service. Um, and we may make some suggestions or some edits or whatever, but he, he mainly. Yeah, we, we have a, a weekly service planning meeting, and, and in that we'll review, and then we'll go four weeks out, three weeks out, two weeks out, one week out. And so they'll know themes I'm hitting, and then um, I'm, I'll come and usually go, these are some I want, and then I give some freedom for you know, other stuff. But, I mean, when all said and done, they, it'll be a bad thing if we, we sing something that's not true. Agreed. Um, <laughs> yeah. Which there are things that are out there to sing that are not true, so that's good. I'm very thankful to God for his grace and our worship pastor who's over here who helps shepherd that whole process uh, musically, and we work together through the Word, um, praying through, looking at the Word, and then determining where to best... Lead, lead people musically in worship around the word for revelation and response. Uh, we have a chapel twice a week. I have a wonderful team that coordinates that. Uh, at the beginning of the semester, I meet with, and we have multiple uh, folks that do uh, worship. So we're using somewhere between, oh, I don't know, eight or ten different uh, groups uh, some connected to the seminary. Well, actually, all connected. Some are seminary staff and students, but some are graduates. Uh, Daniel Renstrom, Lane Wood, Donnie that led the music yesterday when David preached his at Imago Day. I meet with them, uh, tell them what I'm wanting them to do, and then I give them a certain uh, measure of freedom. I tell them the kind of things I'd like to have happen. Uh, this semester, it's been really good. I think maybe a couple of times that something was done. Never heresy, just I didn't think it was done as well as I would have wanted, or maybe it was a song our folks were not familiar with, and 
Uh, I always tell folks, uh, I don't want you to practice your new songs on my congregation. Practice it on somebody else's congregation, and then that is, it doesn't work well. So it, using that kind of a system has worked well for us. I didn't approve your songs today. Then I didn't know if you were going to sing because you wouldn't tell us if you were going to sing. So it's true. We had to wait and see. Are we going to sing again tonight? Okay. <laughs> so, hey, I, I think this might be helpful. Um, so we, we're changed. talking a lot about um, evangelism and, and sharing the gospel and conversions and, and those things. And, and I know one of the things that's happened in pastoral ministry for me is that um, after my conversion, it, it was very easy to um, share the gospel because I was always around lost people. Um, and, and the larger our church has gotten or the busier life has gotten in church, I, I, I found it to be um, like I have to really work at engaging with lost people and, and finding them. Like everyone who works at the church is saved. It, it's kind of a prerequisite for our pastors to be converted before we hire them. Even, even for, for membership? Not always for membership, but uh, just for staff. So in the end... He's kidding. Just to be yeah, clear. just yeah, FYI, just <laughs> FYI. And so, um, in, in, in the end, it would be, I think it might be helpful for, for us to chat just a bit about kind of how we create that space in order to not just tell our people, be an evangelist, God can save, but, but actually practice that in other ways than the, the pulpit. I've tried to teach um, the young pastors in our residency and, and things like that, that that at the end of the day, you, you, you can't be a ferocious evangelist in the pulpit and a coward in your neighborhood, that, that you've got to be able to do both of those. And, and maybe the Lord won't give you as much fruit in your neighborhood as he gives you in your pulpit, but, that, but you need to model for your people what it looks like to live missionally in, um, in the world. So maybe it'd be helpful to just kind of chat some about that specifically. Deborah, like you've lived in the same house all 18 years, haven't you? And so I'm guessing by this time, because this is what happens, I'm, I'm sure you've shared the gospel with your neighbors now. And, and so what does it look like moving forward to continue to find and build relationships with people who don't know Christ and share the gospel with that confidence that conversion can happen? Uh, it's taking opportunities that just come up, you know, randomly. So like Jamie and I with a taxi cab driver two nights ago with Abraham from uh, the Gambia. So pray for Abraham who's uh, a Muslim who doesn't think there's any difference between Islam and Christianity, and yet when Jamie wisely pressed him, he then saw some differences, and so we shared the gospel with him. So it's taking up opportunities like that. Uh, it's continuing to rehearse the gospel with neighbors that I've shared it with for years, uh, just as I have opportunity to continue those relationships. It's going to the same places, everything from the bank to the dry cleaners to the, where I eat, uh, you know, getting to share the gospel there. So uh, one of the guys who is a waiter at the restaurant, I, or a restaurant that I often go to, uh, has been to my, my place five times now to go through Christianity Explained. So it's just it's stuff like that, just looking at those things. But I really think that as ministers of the Word, we, we have to realize that part of what we do in agreeing to become ministers is we kind of almost trade in our private driving license because we do get to and have to do the public teaching. And so I'm doing evangelism every time I'm preaching. There are non-Christians sitting there. I'm having conversations at the door. And part of the way I prepare for that time well is by the, the saints giving their money to set me aside full time so I can study and prepare. So there is a bit of a trade-off. So I do think that if I was somehow released from this and was, you know, just having another job that wasn't full time in ministry, was around non-Christians more normally, I do think I would be able to share the gospel more, and I think I need to factor that in. Uh, but so I, and so I really need to take joy in the privilege of being able to share it publicly. That is evangelism. But then looking for other opportunities as I can help to, to wangle them. So like we heard Ashok's testimony, and so I got to talk to him because of this hunter that he worked with who was a guy I was discipling. So Hunter kind of brought me in, and I got to meet with Ashok. So it can be other guys that you're meeting with help facilitate conversations for you. Um, yeah, I, I, I really want to grow as an evangelist, um, so I wouldn't presume to, to sort of hold out myself as a model. I, I will say I had a very kind of New Testament experience at Capitol Hill Baptist Church in terms of uh, watching this brother's life and, and having my pattern of ministry and life be shaped 
uh, by what I saw in him. And so what he just articulated um, really does characterize a lot of what I do. Um, the preaching of the gospel, Sunday to Sunday, um, Wednesday night Bible study, um, the, the sort of habitual cultivating of relationships and routines um, where I'm brought into contact with folks and are trying to witness. Uh, maybe the one thing that, that I get opportunity to do a bit more than you do because of the kind of um, cultural Christianity and the high view of pastors and, uh, and uh, of pastors in Cayman is I get to do a lot of counseling with non-Christians uh, or nominal Christians. And so my counseling ministry has, has become a large part of my evangelism ministry uh, in that way. And so that, that would be where I would be brought into more contact with folks. Yeah, I mean, um, our growth group, our small group, we hold each other accountable for, you know, having a list of folks that we're, we're talking to. And we're just encouraging our people, you know, um, ordinary people doing ordinary things with gospel intentionality and just trying to rub shoulders with folks. So for me personally, I, I coach a baseball team. Um, a son was playing tonight. I got a text message from Kimberly. She's all excited that a bunch of them may come over tomorrow for a birthday party. And so I just been, I've been working on these dads and um, that's my little mission field right now and got my growth group uh, praying for these guys. And then the rest is, I'm just say what Mark and Tabidi has said, just frequenting the same restaurants and, and those types of things. And, and also trying to create an evangelistic culture in the church. And I think some of that comes through your preaching of, of having a few sidebars in your sermons where you're intentionally speaking to the non-Christian. I think that'll, uh, I think they'll eventually show up either because you're answering their questions or their friends believe you'll answer their questions and they'll bring them. And that whole thing, and indirectly, you're helping your people learn how to engage as well. And so I think all that sort of goes together, you know. A, a few little notes on the preaching thing, just to, uh, and then Matt, I want you to share one thing about that. Simple things that I try to do, like when I refer to something in the Bible, I'll very often say, you know, that's in chapter 4, verse 3. Uh, the large numbers are the chapter numbers. That's number 4. The small numbers after to the verse numbers. It's verse 3. If you've been brought up in church all the time, that seems silly. But for an outsider, that's really helpful. Let's them know they're there. They're welcome to be there. It really helps them read their Bible. You, you, tell, them the, you tell them the page numbers be, of the pew yeah. Bibles, which I think is uh, outstanding yeah. because Just imagining someone so. coming in for the first time, they don't know what a Bible yeah. is. Yeah. They don't know what a chapter is, a book. So I think that's very sensitive yeah. and helps them then feel welcome to not feel like, well, I'm just too dumb to be here. I'm not going to be able to get anything yeah. out of this. I, I agree completely. Yeah. I always want to be very clear on the gospel at some point in a sermon. At the same time, I'm really happy to raise questions in the unbeliever's mind that I don't answer. So, you know, if you've been somebody who's really given yourself over to pleasure for this last week, let me just ask you a question. Have you gotten what you've wanted? And then just pause to let it sink in. And then just move on with the sermon. You know, just kind of just, just sort of <laughs> causing a crisis of faith in their own unbelief. You know, helping them just to, to see, let, let their own dissatisfaction echo a little bit. You know, Matt, you talk about different lanes of people that come to the village. Uh, and well, I think that can be helpful. Well, what we do in the welcome is, is we'll, we'll basically, hey, glad that you're here. But before we get started, before we open up our, our Bibles, before we sing any songs, before we, you know, say anything from, from our text, uh, we're glad that you're here. Uh, and, and so some of you, you've grown up in church your whole life, and we're glad that you're here. This will be really normal for you. You'll, you'll kind of see what we do. And, and then there are some of you that, that you come a couple of times a year, and so we're glad that you're here. Um, and then there's some of you, man, you're, you, you were invited by a friend and weren't, weren't sure what you were getting into. You, you came honestly to appease them more than you're really interested. But, man, before we do anything, I just want you to know I'm glad that you're here. Um, come from a background of a little skepticism myself. Uh, and so if you have legitimate concerns and questions about our faith, something you hear today, just know it's a safe place to ask those questions, to have, to wonder about what we mean by certain things. And so just, just know that it's a safe place for you. We're not, we, we actually would encourage you to voice your doubts and concerns, not, not feel like you've got to hide those from us. We're not easily offended here. And so just, just saying something simple like that at the beginning has been really helpful for people. In fact, um, I, we, we've, we've had people say as they're being baptized that that little statement at the beginning just made them breathe and then they were able to hear and all their, you know, just on a spring ready to pounce on something that I would say or one of our pastors would say that they disagree with just kind of melted away under the, I know you're here, it's okay to doubt. It's okay to have questions. It's okay to even have some problems with what you've seen historically out of believers. 
And so just know that you don't have to hide that here. You can voice that. Nobody, you've got nothing that's going to shock us, worry us, cause us to freak out. I'm just glad you're here. And, and so just doing that in the welcome has been really, it's been a really cool thing. So, Any encouraging conversion stories in the last year that you could share briefly to close out our day with some real encouragement in this? Tony, I know you're involved with a kind of new church plant uh, in this last year, let's say. Any story you could share with us briefly, like a younger son that you held out so well for us today? Uh, well, one was my 12-year-old son, adopted from Ukraine. We baptized him on Easter, and um, so that was that was super exciting. And uh, we've we have baptized uh, I don't know how many people now. It hasn't been a massive number of people, um, but we're starting to see uh, I think uh, the beginning of of a harvest of. A lot of seeds have been planted. A lot of this, these questions in our groups, you know, who you're sharing the gospel with and seeing our people seriously praying for individuals. And so we're, we're praying for large numbers of those. Anybody else? Last year? Well, do you just want us to tell? Yeah, just some encouraging story of God doing this. Um, well, one of the kind of amazing ones that, that we saw, or it was amazing for me, um, Brad Paynes, one of our elders is in the room, was actually involved in this process, so it was so great. There was a man um, named Mike who, who came, sat up front, but was just not, was there for his wife, did not, did not want anything to do with, I mean, folded, scowling, would never stand. You know, I don't know why those people sit up front. Uh, there, we're a big enough church that you can hate me from way back there. You don't have to do that. And, uh, but man, he sat up front and he just scowled and, um, uh, was, was really angry. And, and one of our elders that lives right across the street from him man, just continued to, to love on him and encourage him and engage him. And, um, and then man, we went over there for some intervention on some marital stuff and, um, but still just not interested in the gospel at all. Very respectful at that point. All right. So that kind of, you know, anger had kind of faded to, uh, you know, I'll put up with you. And, um, and then, man, he, he got really sick, and, and so since I had been through cancer, and, and here he has cancer, then all of a sudden we got to get together and talk drugs and talk about how bad treatment is awful and what it's like to lay on the bathroom floor and wish God would just get this over with. And, uh, we, you know, we got to have those kind of conversations. And then, um, and then man, we, we went over one day, and, and he was saying, I've become a Christian, and I'm a skeptic. So I'm like, I don't know. If you're, if you're just thinking... You're just thinking, oh, I'm going to die, so I've got to, you know, put my allegiance. Then I, I don't know that that's going to happen. He's, he's got a pastor for a friend now, yes. so he must be a Christian. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so Brad and I sat down at his dining room table, and Brad's next door neighbor knew him a lot better than I did. But man, we just got the opportunity to really, and man, I, I just gently pressed on: Is this about seeing your kids in heaven? Is this about? I mean, what is this? And man, he just full on just laid it out for Brad and I. No, no, no. I believe this about Jesus Christ. Believe that he's rescued my heart. Believe. And then we, um, he, he only came to church probably four or five more times before he actually died. But um, one of those times, man, he, during worship, just stood up. I mean, on a walker, just kind of pushed himself up, stood up, and then just raised his hands while we worshiped. And man, I was just a mess. And so Mike, and then got to preach his funeral and a lot of unbelievers at his funeral. And, uh, man, it was just a beautiful, really transforming work in his heart because he was just such an ornery, bitter, angry dude. And all of that melted away those last few months. It was beautiful. And so that's one of my favorites from this past year, just to think on him and what God did there. Praise God. Uh, think of a, a, a woman in our um, church uh, from Venezuela. Her name is Myra. Um, came to the church. She's from a long ago Catholic background, um, martial artist for a number of years, during that same time involved with the Eastern religions. Um, lost her mom and her dad in pretty quick succession, um, but had believed the notion that um, pain and suffering was an illusion. And so she had all this grief that she was denying for eight years, marriage busted up, eight years. Uh, she comes to church because there's a guy um, who's known on our island who works in the uh, DMV for licensing, and he witnesses that everybody who comes in DMV. And so he's, he's, she's sitting in there trying to get her DMV thing, and he's, he's doing some kind of paperwork, and he looks up, and he just launches into the gospel, and she's just like, you know, what is, and so she went out to her car, and she just wept. And our, our church is right next to the DMV. And she decided she was going to come to church. 
And so she came Sunday, sat in the back, um, sort of skirted out real quickly. Next Sunday, we had baptisms. She came to the beach where we were having the baptisms, and I went over to introduce myself, and, and she was just fearful, just frightened. And she just stayed way off and sort of the opposite of, of the guy you're talking about. And um, somehow or another, she had come, and one of those Sundays, we were making some points about submission in the text that we were preaching, and she had just great objection to that. And so my wife, Christy, had met her, and, and they decided to get lunch. And she's just railing on submission and you fundamentalists and Christians are crazy and all that good stuff. Well, she finds out that she teaches salsa also. And so they have this wonderful conversation about salsa when she's explaining that in salsa, the woman must follow the man's lead or, or the dance doesn't work. And my wife says, so you do understand submission. You know. <laughs> And, and that just turned some things slightly for her. And in the consequence of coming and sitting under the word and, and Bible study, the Lord, the Lord saved her and converted her. And to just see now um, this woman go from this kind of rabid opposition to Paul, Paul's the enemy, to just loving the word and having this infectious delight in the word and bringing all of her friends. And just, it's just wonderful because she's coming out of a background with lots of relationships with persons uh, and homosexual lifestyles and other kinds of lifestyles. And, um, and, and she's just, how do I get the gospel to these folks? How do I share the gospel? It's just this new vibrant life. And it's just, just a joy, man. It's a joy. A couple of things come to my mind. Uh, first, in a general way, uh, just rejoicing over a variety of elder brothers repenting of their sin and, and turning in faith to Christ. Uh, just it seems like many of these stories in our baptistry are reflecting that. But one other thing that really comes to my mind as soon as you ask that is uh, a brother who's sitting right over here who uh, I think it was four years ago came and sat down in my office and was in, in bad shape in a variety of ways, in a younger brother kind of way. And... Uh, God, by his grace, took hold of this, this brother's heart and transformed his life. And now he's up here with his wife in seminary. And last night, as we we're fellowshipping together, he's sharing with me about uh, some guys he's sharing with in a coffee shop that are eagerly responding to the, to the word and want to dive in more, who are still lost. But I just praise God for the, the way he saves and the way he uses us to lead others. It's just, it was, it was a glorious reminder of this gospel is good and it does the work. Yeah. Amen. God still converts. Anything else before we close? I just wanted to say a word. Yes, please. About Tony. Brother, thank you for uh, preaching the gospel this morning and, and preaching that parable. Um, thank you for leaving us face to face with the Lord too. As a better big brother. Uh, I, I don't know that I've ever heard anyone sort of bring Christ to light in that way, in that parable. And so just thank you for leaving us looking into his face and, and hoping in him, brother. So thank you. Thank you. Amen.